Hive of Club members. I'm Jen. And I'm Carrie. And this is Warhammer 40k Book Club, where we read from a crag. This is episode number 101, and our book is The Traitor's Hand by Sandy Mitchell. Digitally. It is yet another misadventure of Caiaphas Cain as they land on a planet beset by Slaneshi cultists. Good times are always bound to follow with that particular item. We posted several questions on our website, wh40kbookclub.com, and we encourage participation in our conversations via YouTube, our site, or Encrypted Vox channel. I would say spoiler warning, but there's really no spoiler warnings when it comes to Caiaphas Cain, unless, I don't know, there's really no spoiler warnings. But it's always fun to read along with us, so definitely check out the book before listening to this episode from start to finish, as we'll be going into it in our fancy Aruba hats fresh off vacation <laughs> in great detail. Look, I wanted the tackiest thing that we could find. I feel like I was getting if we're totally honest. Uh, and we found tacky. <laughs> with that, let's dive in. As always, did you enjoy the book? It was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. This, uh, I love this book. Um, I I always like things when, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in a second, but I like the idea that they show up because, oh my gosh, there's like cultist activity, but then there's these other people and wait, what is going on here? They're not even here for us, really. Um, the guard's more like a nuisance, especially to the world leaders. I, I like the concept. <laughs> it's fun. Yeah, and, uh, like I... I mean, I laughed pretty much all the way through this. These books are just funny. And that remains, Caiaphas Cain remains, like, don't get me wrong, other, there are 40k books that have humorous moments or comments in them. Not like this. Um, I think of uh, The Last Gee Haley um, Dawn of Fire book, mm. where the, uh, where Fabian and the, uh, <clears throat> lady from the ship hookup and Lucerne is not a very good wing man. And it's just like, Oh, they were having, they were being getting well acquainted or something like that. Like that's humorous. Mm -hmm. It's not funny. These books are funny. The little side comments, everything about it. They just, I feel like I giggle throughout the whole book. And I have to say, this was my first one listening to on audible and man, I highly recommend that. Really? They get this guy, Stephen Pering, who I've heard a few times in the Horus Heresy, and he he has a very grandfatherly voice, so it kind of suits Caiaphas Cain. And then they also get a separate voice to do Amberly, a separate voice to do Sulla, to and then a separate voice that for the for the guys that do the you know the 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 histiographies. So it's yes. really well done. And the woman that they got for Sulla is so dry and morose but it's like she's really trying to make this interesting and amberly vale just has a very mellifluous voice it's they're like yeah i may need to listen to the others with this because they're so, so funny hey okay next time we read a caiaphas cane book i will listen to it because i'm intrigued and that bridges us nicely into what parts stood out to you. And I think I've said this for the other two books that we've read in the Kane series, but that is one thing that there, Sandy Mitchell actually has quite a bit of talent going on here on display. Oh my God. Because, because not only, not only do his jokes all land and they all are very clever and funny. Um, and I've, as, as I've always said, he, he reminds me a little bit of Dave Chappelle's um, Prince skit. Oh God. Because yeah. He knows how to have fun with the Warhammer 40k universe without thumbing his nose at it. Right. He's not like, ooh, isn't it so stupid, world leaders? No, he's having fun with it. And he knows how to make the humor fit. Um, and then the solo bits are so dry and boring. And and then like when we had the section where Beige had written it, written it, written it. He wrote it. I am not drinking alcohol tonight either, y'all. Um, those were different. Like, they all feel like different voices, different people. Like, he really does encapsulate that very well. And the Sulla stuff is... The funny thing about the Sulla... So with the, with the Audible, it really hits home that, yes, it's boring, but you can tell that she is... The way that they're written, it's like... It's like a brand new writer in college, right? They're trying to make the most 
insane things. Oh, oh no, you know what? It's like someone who's they're being assigned. You have to write exposition. You know, you have too much dialogue in your book. You need to write exposition. How can we make this exciting? So the fact that in some of her stuff, she's just like, when the boots landed on the ground and I could just feel like the rush coming up to me. It's like, hun, <laughs> you're trying to make the most boring shit exciting. Well, and I always, I do love Amberly Bale's commentary because of course... Kane is so irritated with Sulla and Amberly Bale is just like, no, actually, she was a very good commander. Like, yeah, but sister, have you read her stuff? Her stuff is not good. Well, it wasn't even only just him either, right? It's like, you know, Captain, uh, Captain Detoy, just like, it's like, oh, she's on her own. Awesome. <laughs> I... I just, I really do. I, I find that to be, and it is, it's, it does feel like separate authors writing it. And he mm -hmm. pretty well slips in and out of those styles. And the fact that Kane is so humorous and he's having fun in the world. And then Solo's the opposite of that. But then Amberly Vale also, you can feel her, oh, you. Right. Tone of voice in all of her footnotes. You can just feel it. She's not irritated. She's just like, Ew. So, honestly, like, one of my favorite parts was from one of her things. And uh, it was in chapter three when Kane talked about how he, you know, squashed, like, this pleasant pulpy thing. He just put his boot, boot through it and you tapped her thing. And she's talking about what the local vegetation is. The best part, so I'm listening to this in the car. My husband's there with me. Is when she says Medicaid records for the district show no fatalities among the anchorites, although several were subsequently treated for minor injuries apparently related to treading on hastily discarded gardening tools. I lost it. That is funny. And Sean was like, was that rakes in faces? I'm like, that's exactly what that was. Rakes in faces. It's amazing. Just amazing. And another one that just tickled me, and I could not stop giggling and laughing to the point where kids were like, that isn't even not that funny. But it just got to me, is when Kane said, there's been a disturbance in the warp. I couldn't help it. Couldn't help it. My, uh, my, my, my iPad is, like, totally putzing out here on me. It's driving me crazy now because I'm trying to pull up my things. Because I had one of those two... Um, the, um, it's when he first is meeting, uh, beige and, um, they're sitting there talking and he says something like, Oh, not everyone shares my. Oh no, we lost and your mic. Kane... Lost your mic there for a second. Oh, sorry. Repeat that. Um, it's when, um, it's this, it just tickled me and I don't know why, but it's actually in the very beginning when he's talking with beige and Beige is like, oh, I'm afraid not everyone shares my appreciation of your humor. And uh, Kane says, well, good for them. I said, beginning to understand why no one had shot him by accident yet. <laughs> oh, just, his... there, there was another comment he made right there. He's like, all right, calling Jurgen a bit untidy was rather like saying Abaddon the Despoiler gets a bit cranky in the morning. <laughs> Again, this... <laughs> Stuff that they says, it, it, like the stuff that he says, and some of his turns of phrase, uh, they're just like, amazing. Like when he's talking about Corporal Mago, like a cheerfully sociopathic young woman who barely came up to his chin, which made little difference as it only took her about a tenth of a second to bring it down to the level of her knee. Amazing. Or like when, when he makes that, when Beige makes a comment about Castile and he can see Castile's getting riled, riled up. He's like, I can see that she was about to make some remark about some human anatomy at an improbable size. <laughs> and then what was, oh my God, now I can't, I thought I, I thought I bookmarked this, but yes, this is another phrase. And it was, for some reason, it just tickled me, but I also was like, oh, you done messed up, A.A. Ron, is when Beige refers to her as the petticoat colonel. Oh, my God. Like, even so I'm listening to that in my car and I hear that. And even I kind of tensed up a little bit. I was like, oh, dude. And he's oh, like, friend, do you want to die tonight? And he's like, he suddenly stops when he sees the fresh hatred and anger on the faces of the Valhallans. 
Sandy Mitchell just has wonderful phrasing. Um, I, I don't know. And that is a, like, we need to not like this character. We need to know that this character it has completely and totally disregarded Kane, disregarded his entire regiment, and we need to know that he needs to insult this person without, without going for something really trite, right? Like, mm -hmm. oh, that bitch, or something like that, right? Like, he could have called her a lady of the evening. He could have called her a lot of things. Petticoat Colonel. Bruh. That's, uh, that's pretty rough, but it also made me kind of laugh because I was like, that's, that's just funny. Right. But also you're going to die now. Because it's just, it's so dismissive and it's so cutting. I liked that one oh, a yes. lot. Uh, he just, again, Sandy Mitchell just has phenomenal phrasing. Just, yeah. To use an old archer. I mean, like, what was that? Oh. I, I, Quagmire of Inertia. That's awesome. <laughs> I have that one highlighted as well. I mean, just like, okay. I was, yes. I, actually, that, that was one of the uh, other writers who wrote that because he's talking about the, you know, pin into this quagmire of inertia. That's such a great description of politics in a nutshell. I love it. Came, I mean, came the news that a chaos raiding fleet was about to attack the planet, followed shortly by by the arrival of five regiments of Imperial Guard and a squadron of warships. It would hardly be an exaggeration to say that panic ensued. Brilliant. No, and that's not even from Kane. Great. That was from one of, like, you know, the, the uh, historians. I mean, yeah, he has when he talks about how working. he has to go, you know... Um, investigate what's been going on and like i even read this sentence out loud to my husband and he laughed as i'd expected the troopers were in something of a holiday mood at the prospect of being back in sub-zero temperatures again and this exuberance manifested itself in a steady stream of minor infractions that are right there had me laughing which kept me busy enforcing discipline and placating a succession of bar owners, praetors, and aggrieved local citizens whose sons and daughters apparently found something irresistible about the contents of a guard uniform. Only he can make a run-on sentence not feel like a run-on sentence. Yes. I absolutely, I just, I love his style. I'm, the quotes. I just announced that I'm, we're going to get another one. But so, I'm so excited. The quotes at the beginning of each chapter, holy crap. Oh my gosh. When that one from Eeyore the donkey, I nearly peed myself. I was just like, <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> he, yeah, I, I, I look, the hype is off the train for there being another Caiaphas Kane book. And actually, one of the things that we had just talked about, this is one of those things that really, so I really like the show Always Sunny in Philadelphia. And one of the reasons that I like Always Sunny is that you can pick it up whenever. Like, if you haven't watched the last 10 episodes, you could just watch the next one and you're going to know what's going on, right? Um, they'll reference maybe something that happened previously and you're just like, okay, cool. Um, I like that you don't have to, like, completely follow along and you're not just like, okay, what happened last uh, I feel the same way about the Caiaphas Kane books. For a lot of reasons. Um, but one, just that they're funny and you don't have to read them. We are reading them in sequential mm -hmm. order because we're going into the backlog here. But when the new book comes out, probably would have no problem picking it up, reading it, and then we can go back and fill in. But like, because you can just pick it up and you don't have to sit there and be like, oh my God, what happened last book? Like the number of times with the Dawn of Fire series, that, that we sit there and we're like, was this referenced in the last book? Oh my gosh, that's right. This was in the last book. Um, there's all this, like, there's an odd sense of continuity. And I know we kind of went on a rant after the last book where we were mm -hmm. like, yeah, this item that was referenced in book two, which was written two years ago. Um, I just really like that about Caiaphas Kane. It's the closest thing to candy bar books. I will say, though, this book referenced the second book. A lot more than the second book referenced the first book because the, this comes mm. off right right off the heels. And that they referenced it in saying that we were recently in these sub 
zero temperatures mm-hmm. with this. They didn't get into what happened. Um, I think he might have referenced a little bit about the problems with the Mechanicus. And it kind of actually makes a little sense about his attitude towards the Mechanicus, this one, after what happened in the last book. But, I mean, it's nothing that, you know, you don't have to know about that. Some people just don't like the Mechanicus. Which actually made it more delightful. A later scene in the book, which I also loved with the, um, the disarming of the bomb. <laughs> but uh, one thing that stood out to me about this book, too, that I want to mention is that because you, one of the things that you and I have talked about in the past is that the 40K universe is, and I love this, actually, I want to make it very clear that I love this about the 40K universe. It's somewhat sexless, especially when you consider that one of the gods sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It is oddly sexless. Sex is often implied. We've seen scenes often where two characters have clearly just hooked up or they kind of reference it, but it's always done like in a, um, like I think about the Knights of McGrag book, right? Somebody knocks on the girl's door and she's like, back so soon. Right. All right. So like, we know what's going on there. This book, probably the close, like the most sexful book we've read like he talks about the joy girls and the slaneshi like there's when amber when amberly mm-hmm. comes down to him right like this is this book it was the only book where i was like oh damn like, yeah they're definitely leaning into that side of it but again without being garish without being trite without being in your face of like right again i just it's one of the things i really like about the 40k universe is that they don't ever go tawdry I'd be disappointed if they did, to be totally honest. Because I would too. Because that's not why I'm here. If I want to read Correct. that, I'll go to some other book. And let's be very real. The Slaneshi guys are not the guys that I want to be tawdry. Because <laughs> it's just going to involve a whole lot of that's not right. <laughs> no. Normally I don't kink shame, but mm, mm, Slaneshi. So let's talk about Keen and Beige. They're great foils in this book, um, but especially Beige and the Talarans. Talarans? Talarns? Tal- um, Talarns is how they said it in the Talarns. audible. Talarns. Talarns. They, okay, okay. they also say Lieutenant, which drives me crazy. Oh, that's a hard one for me. I'm like, where's the F? Um, where's the F? I don't see no F. I want you to know that years and years and years ago we had gone i don't remember what movie it was like i was in my early 20s i had seen something and they kept referring lieutenant lieutenant i thought they were actually saying like left tenant Mm. and i could not figure anyways took me a little bit older than that one the Um, other thing they said which threw me off for a second if i hadn't happened to be looking down at my book while i was listening to it i would have been so confused for landing zone we say lz they do not LZ. Right, because they don't ever really say Z. I was like, that's interesting. So for their for their alphabet, they won't say YZ, they say YZ. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Something I was like, well, if I had not been looking at this, I've been like, LZ. I've been like, is that a name? Is that a what does that mean? All right. It's like El Nino, LZ. Mm. Um so why did not? You, like, did you understand? Did you like? Did you like beiges? And the, did, let me rephrase this. Did you like the Talarns? Did you understand them? Were they interesting versus Talon? I uh, I or understood. Talons. I understood the Talarns uh, because there are always there are those factions. I, I what one thing that really cracked me up though was that it was such like an obvious set how opposite they were because you have Kane who is known for being tall and thin and handsome. Talk about beige being. As they put it, porcine, probably one of my favorite descriptors of calling somebody fat or portly. I think they said that a few times. Pudgy, he also said a couple of times. Uh, and uh, so then the 597th, they're from Valhalla, a sub-zero ice world. So they're on the, uh, the cold side of the planet. The Talarns are desert people, complete opposite. They were put on the hot side and they were more than fine. So it's like some very, you know, we have some people who like to have fun. Some people who are just like, no, like we're here to serve the emperor. Like they're like the the ultramarines on steroids. Like we follow the letter of 
this of the imperial truth and the imperial edicts and blah 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 we don't ever de deviate from it like i love that scene where the talarns and the uh, uh, valhans are fighting together and um oh it was uh, uh guilford and she says having fun yet or was, no magot magot that's she's like are you having fun yet and he's like doing the emperor's deeds as his own reward but yes this is satisfying it's like like yeah that's such a good list like you know uh contrast like kind of the like, compliment and contrast at, at the same time but it also humanize them yes because there is something and i think we've talked about this with the sisters the adeptus sororitas and the black templars to an extent mm -hmm. like there is this sense of dourness and just the piety and being those by the letter by the emperor's divinity by the yeah the, not very fun and exciting people um and but there is this like sense with like with the sisters and with the black templars i kind of understand it i always find it weird to find it in regiments because humans um like regular old humans but i did like like that was a great scene no these, these are still humans they're still people mm -hmm. right um and I did like that he resisted the urge to make them not antagonistic towards the Valhallans. Like, right. yeah, there was a rivalry and they were kind of chippy, but we didn't get to the big end. And it was like, ha, ha, ha. Um, they didn't have that. Um, there's a couple of Gaunt's Ghost books where that kind of stuff happens. So I was, I was a little nervous in books and I should have, I should have trusted Sandy Mitchell a little bit more than that, I guess is the thing. Um, I was happy that they, it just was, as you said, this nice contrast and this nice show that the Valhallans, they're different. Yes. They're different people. So one of the things that I've always said about Cain is that or we, we've actually had this conversation on this podcast. Cain insists he's a coward. Insists he's a coward. He's always trying to look for a way out. He's always trying to not be... And he has, like, this domino luck of <laughs> being in the right, depending on which. I don't know if that's really narratively, luck. Narratively. Um... <laughs> well, narratively, right place, right time. Uh, maybe from a human scale, wrong place, wrong time. <laughs> right. Three books into the series, does the argument, does his insistence hold water for you? Um, I kind of agree with Amberly Vale that... Yes, he talks about how he has to have this reputation that he's modest, but I really think that he is. Um, he doesn't want to call attention to himself, and I think part of it is that he does want to save his own skin, so he doesn't want to call attention to himself because, as he even said, like, I think it was in the very first book, it's like, you know, if you prove that you're you're amazing and you can get the job done, well, they're just ready to throw you back into an even worse situation because if you did that, wow, what do you do here? Um, so, I mean... Because he even talks about how he's like, you know, I didn't, you know, live 200 years, you know, by not listening to my paranoia. It's like, well, yes, that, that's true. So you did a paranoia. You do have a um, a sense of self-preservation. And it's just interesting that the times you do the self-preservation, it ends up being like the bravest thing ever. Like when he's talking, he wanted to get a wall in between him and everybody else. And then when the fighting's over, they're like, oh, my gosh, you got between us and the fighting so that we could help save this guy. And he's like, yeah, exactly what exactly I did. Exactly what I did. <laughs> That's why it reminds almost... me a lot. You know, I miss this guy, uh, uh, Brother Alpha Bossa. And his thing with Caiaphas Cain and you have the people interrupting one another it's like he was actually doing this and then this happened and he like saved us all and he's like uh yeah it reminded me so much much of that because like we almost think he has a domino a warhammer 40k version of domino, domino probably like he talks about you know the palms itching you know and he gets that any the palms itching or his bowels he's always his bowels twist i'm like dude can you say something else you know his bowels twisting but he always acts on that. Or if he notices something, he acts on it. So maybe you're right. He does have that domino luck. And that's what's kind of kept him alive all this time. Maybe he does have some cowardice. And he is kind of looking at this. But his luck actually keeps him in the right place at the right time. But I also think he's like... Like the scene that I think about, like the, 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 um, the sequence that I really think about 
is when he's like, oh, I just, like, he gets to stay at the Capitol, right? Because he's like, oh, thank God. Because somebody should stay here. Um, And then, like, the ship crashes in, and he's like, oh, everybody has to evacuate. Right? Okay, your mic cut out again. Oh, for God's sake. So it was like you said, everyone needs to evacuate. Yeah, so he's like, everybody needs to evacuate, but then he kind of gets the... Something doesn't feel right about this either. And he goes back and there's a bomb and they have to disarm it. But like, it's all of the thing where, yes, it's almost like this domino sense of him saving the day of like, okay, somebody needs to stay back at the city. It just doesn't feel like they do. And then this happens. And then we do it back. No, wait, I don't, something, nothing about this feels right. Um, he has, it's the 40K version. So of course it's not like he jumps out of an airplane, hits a giant inflatable bear and walks away. No problem. Right. right. Um, it's a 40K version. It's this weird sense of every time he's like, I just feel like maybe I should be over there because I'll be safer. And well, that's where everybody is. So what I always think of is when it's in the second book, actually. Where he gets into, and because that's the one with, uh, actually it's not going to narrow it down if I say some alien race because I think everything was thrown in the second book. But it's when he's like fighting the um, the gene stealers. And he like, and it gets into this thing about what he does. And it's like some brilliant fighting moves to get this off. And he's like, I'm sorry, dude, a coward can't fight like that. He holds off not one but two world eaters in this. Now, now granted, granted there there was, but they were chooched. Oh, but the second guy had a frag grenade. Yeah, but at the same time, but that's most infantrymen can't, you know, fend off a you know a one legged. If there was like a one legged, one armed space marine, they still couldn't, you know. Uh, well, especially not the world eaters. Now, all right, they have finesse. No. Do they have an intently murderous rage and want to kill you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and so I, I feel like at this point, Cain would probably be a pretty good skull, uh, skull throne. Um, but like, but so like, I think of that, and even I think of this, like, like you were saying with the bomb, but what my first thought was not the bomb. It was when he notices that that one dropship is in danger. Does he, he could totally run away from that drop ship, like go towards the 100%. fighting, just go towards the fighting. But instead he risks his life to save this drop ship. Exactly. So I like, mean, he mm. does that. He, and with the first world eater, he's kind of like, Oh God, the second one, because it's charging right at him, he basically is just like, all right. And you can, you can argue that like instinct and muscle memory, blah, 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 blah. Um, but, Again, it, it gets a little bit harder to hear. I understand the modesty. I understand the self affair But from, because I think that he believes he's a coward, obviously, right? It's real hard to make that argument. When... I mean, he may totally believe, he may have 100% imposter syndrome, you know? Totally could be. I mean, that, that could be exactly what it is. Or this whole thing could be an act and this is all part of his modesty, but... I don't think so, though. I, I, I really don't. Especially it with his... It feels genuine. Like, you know, man, I laughed so hard when that second world eater attacked him because he's, you know, yelling his normal thing. He yells. He's like, oh, I'm so tired of hearing that. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, dude. Well, How many people yeah. can say that to, to a world eater? Right? Like, oh, God, these guys again. Pretty much space marines. Space marines can make those claims. Well, yes, because a space uh, marine is more likely to survive a full charge. Pretty much. Uh, so here's the question that I wrestle with. Does Sandy Mitchell want you to believe that he's the coward? You know, well, I'm going to quote one of my literary professors and say, it doesn't matter what the author thinks, he's dead to you. It's what you think. Uh, True, but, you know, the thing that I have trouble with I don't, is... I don't know. I think... Honestly, I think that he just enjoys having fun with this character. I've read a couple of afterwards with stuff, and he just talks about, like, when he submitted that first short story, which is brilliant, if people have not read it, it's, when he, it's how he meets Jurgen, and it's hilarious and brilliant. And I think he kind of started with the idea that he is a coward, but like you said, it was like the domino luck. 
But then, you know, he's like, but for him to be able to stay in this, to be a commissar for 200 years, he's like, that obviously can't totally be true. So what if this is really a journey? This is how he started. And this is how he really feels. But through time, he's grown, which I think would be pretty cool. Oh, no, I agree with that entirely. Um, and I do, I will say that I think it's delightful. Mm -hmm. I think it's absolutely delightful to have this idea of this character who does just have the devil's luck of 40K and really is the hero of the Imperium and but does not think of himself as that way at all. And that, yeah, he has a little bit of latent psyker going on um, with his constant, constant distaste of Jurgen and not quite being able to figure out what's going on there yet. So like big the big end scene right you have this giant demoness mm -hmm. who Jurgen shows up and she's like what and when it's, he, uh, he brushes against her leg and she acts like he burned her exactly exactly <laughs> it's uh it's just the whole world the whole thing that he has built around this and i love the concept of uh caiaphas's um maybe reluctant lover um like I, I do like that she's always though her commentary always adds so much fun mm -hmm. it adds to his mythos like yes of course the biggest imperium of the, the hero of the imperium would be hooking up with an inquisitor on the semi-regular <laughs> don't we all um you know this time though i have to say with her footnotes um i really delighted in her commentary on the ordo malleus <laughs> Yes, I do think that I, I think Amberly is a really great narrative device for him to occasionally give a little bit of humor. To. Yep. And um yes, I liked it, it the this one with the Ordeo Ordo Malleus reminded me a little bit of the traitors from the first book. Right. Just so speaking about him being a coward, let's talk about the tribunal. This yeah. is like the big thing that bends up. So I actually off, can't believe that the tribunal happened, to be honest. Like when Kane said, see you at the tribunal, I thought that was totally like tongue in cheek and everything. And it was never, never going to happen. Did not expect it to actually happen. Dude, it's the Imperium. They love their procedures. They <laughs> adopted, like, the Munitorum and the Administrator like, oh, yes, no, that, that was requested. Stop the request. <laughs> but... It's kind of fun. because So at first I was kind of like, okay, no, normally I would not. Oh, I'm going to get him. We're both on the same side. But I just don't like him. Uh, but, but he's just kind of right, though. Who's right? Mm -hmm. Who's right? Beige? Beige. Calling him like, oh, he's just a coward. And he kept trying to get away from all of the action. I mean, he did yeah. disobey orders when he decided to go to the dread. So there is that. But at the same time, as he puts out, he's a commissar, doesn't really have orders. Um, maybe he calls him a coward. Um, but honestly, there was like really nothing that Kane did that was cowardice, except for maybe he was like, oh, I should go to the bordello. You know, that's where it is. And he's thinking like, there's not going to be anything there. I'm sorry. There's a Slaneshi cult. That's where it's going to be, my friend. Is, right. That would have been the first place that you should have checked for if you were looking for the Slaneshis. Like, the Bordello was probably where it started. Let's be real. Right? Yeah, exactly. Um, it, it was... So there is that interesting thing here that they did touch upon. The Commissars, they occupy such a very, very interesting place in Imperium, right? Mm -hmm. They almost... They're almost, okay, bear with me for a second. They're almost Inquisitor adjacent in so much as within the guard, right? Because, yeah, they have a chain of command. Yeah, they have a group, but within their own regiments, not really. Right. They have control and power, but they don't really. Like, there's, it's such a weird, and especially Kane, much like Gaunt, much like Hark, these are commissars, uh, if we ever get another Severina Rain book, well, I guess kind of, she didn't really have this dynamic, but definitely Victor Hark and Ivram Gaunt have this same dynamic of well-respected, kind of having a little bit of a leadership role, an officer. It's a weird, 
I guess what I'm saying is it's exactly the type of technicality I would expect the Imperium to hold a tribunal for. <laughs> now, I didn't think anything was going to come of it, like against Kane. What? But, right, well, considering there's like, there's uh, three, six, seven other books after this, and then an, an eighth on the way. Yeah, I, th I didn't think anything was going to come of it. And we know he retires. It's mentioned uh, often. And I have a feeling that if you get found guilty to tribunal, that's not retirement. Well, I mean, from a certain point of view, depends on how you define retirement. Yeah, uh, like they threaten beige with the other type of retirement <laughs> from the commissariat. Um, I did. I liked that entire process. I and you're right. Like obviously we know, but does it surprise? Does it surprise you a little bit in the end? When, when he basically says, I'll be a character witness for you, for Beige, after all of this stuff that happens. It doesn't because Caiaphas made a point like the whole time that he was going to be the bigger person like around him. He's like, I don't like him. You can stay very far away from each other. And yeah, I'm going to do things to annoy him because it's kind of funny because they're like little things, right? Putting my hand on your back, saying your first name. You know, that was just such a power move. You know, it's... <laughs> you know like it's not like he brought up all of his you know achievements as everybody else around him and the fact that he just had noticed it or er, er, the guy but at the same time beige didn't live rent free in kane's head like kane never thought about him that much but yet no. kane lived rent free in beige's head very much oh, so very much so they had um they very much, and that's, I think, what also made it really good is that you could tell that, yeah, Kane pretty much hadn't thought of him really mm -hmm. until that point. But I honestly Beige forgot where Beige was until he shows up. It's like, you're under arrest. I'm like, seriously, now? You know, you know, it kind of reminds me of that meme of the lioness like attacking a gazelle, and then that lion decides now's the time to mount her. And the meme is just like, seriously, now? It's kind of what it felt like. Um, I did like it because he is kind of a holy, like, Kane pretty much is like, I kind of forgot about this guy. Like, he's a very holy, forgettable character. Uh, so it kind of worked in his favor there when he just shows up. Oh, you didn't die. Huh. <laughs> Good for you. I mean, right, right now. Um, I love that for you. Uh, because... It worked well to his character, and I think it actually kind of spoke to it. But I like the idea that Kane is like, I am going to be the bigger person, and to have a commissar who will do a favor. Forever the opportunist. Pretty much. Besides, he already had the Talarns on his side. He already basically took the adoration of his own regiment away from him. Just Pretty much. Like, if you are super devout, you are a devout regiment. And you watch a guy go fisticuffs with a world eater. Right. You were never getting those guys back no. on your side. I don't care if he would have, like, killed an inquisitor and a priest in front of them. They would have been like a. Like, really, what this all was about was that Beige, like, Beige was mad that Kane was not being a commissar the way that he would be. Like. All those infractions, those minor infractions, yes, Kane wrote them up, but did he punish them? Not really. He might have, like, made him go clean latrines or something, but not really. And, like, with Jurgen, yeah, he's not so tidy and he kind of smells, but he's, like, the best assistant I could ever have, which is 100% true. Like, Jurgen is the best assistant. Oh my God, yes. Um, he's always shows up at the right time. He actually has his own witty moments. I loved when he said, I forgot the marshmallows at home, sir. That's amazing. You know, amazing. like always right there. Yes, I just got knocked on my ass by, you know, this this uh, this demon, but I'm going to get right back up. And where's my melt -a gun And and when Kane hands it back to him, he's like, I'm so sorry I dropped it, sir. Dude, you like got smacked by a demon tail. <laughs> it's OK. That, that is but, very much Imperial Guard, though. Oh, right. But like but because Kane wasn't handling it the way that Beige would have, therefore Kane's not a good commissar. Well, it's very much, it very much demonstrates that standard imperial way of thought, 
right? There's no deviation. Black and white. Exactly what it said. It's very black and white. And I did like, like, one of the things that I really liked earlier on, that's a really nice juxtaposition between the two of them, is when he's just like, how did you not, how did they say uh, her name? Mago? They said Mago. 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 So when he's just like, how have you not disciplined this woman? Like, well, she was recently promoted and they're about to drop into a probably not the time to mm-hmm. opt to discipline them. And Beige is kind of like, I can't really argue with that. I'm going to. Like, I'm going to get a shitty comment in there, but I can't really argue with that. It's, again, Kane is a master manipulator of people and situations. And I guess that is a compliment. Like, not in the sociopathic way, um, but he is. I guess that's what makes him such a good star in general, mm-hmm. right? But absolutely, this is not the time or the place. And he's a very, he's very sad, like, a excuse. But again, it makes him a very savvy commissar. So we talked a lot about Kane and B. <laughs> we should talk a little bit about our intent. First off. Do you like the idea of the guard just being me and daddy? It was entertaining. I mean, especially when Kane actually did something that I sometimes do when I'm playing video games. It's like when you see a bunch of factions fighting each other, just kind of hang out. Wait and see. You know, no reason to attack them both at once because what if they turn and attack you? The funny thing is when they did attack them, they still didn't pay attention to the guard. They were still focused on each other, which was kind of funny. The guard were just kind of casualties. Yeah. Of like you were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Again. And yet you got in between mom and dad fighting. What's so funny is that honestly, the world eaters and the guard had the same goal. Stop yes. this ritual. <laughs> Pretty much. Like it it makes you wonder. This is one of those things that you wonder, like, had the guard just been like, You got this, buddy. You're good. Would because I feel as though the world eaters, I feel like so they probably would have stopped it. Like they would have gotten some stuff done there. Um, but then they had to kind of deal with the guard. They had yeah. All the, yeah, like maybe, maybe you should have just let them go. Maybe you kind of caused this, you stopped the Cornites, or at least you you delayed them. And not that you could stop them per se. Um, it, I. I loved the whole concept of it because, again, it is one thing I we certainly don't see in guard books as much, and we don't really see it in the outer. Like we see it sometimes with the chaos, like eh, I don't really know these guys, right? Mm-hmm. Or yeah, those guys kind of suck. Um, mostly, I think about it with the Death Guard, right? Even the other traitor legions. Are like, yeah, no, thank you. <laughs> Do not want. It stinks. She tells you something, um, but. I do like this concept because canonically we know a lot of the chaos gods don't really get along to get along. It's kind of nice to see Kord and Slanesh just hashing out their different, let's say. Interesting. There's no Emperor's children though. No. And yet the world leaders show up. Mm-hmm. Maybe Korn was really threatened by this ritual. He was just like, you need to go. <laughs> Somebody with the world leaders was like, not Another slanish demon. Please, no, not another one. There's already enough in the world. We're stopping this one in particular. <laughs> because, you know. Yeah. I don't blame them. So, were the slanishy cultists good foils to the guard? Because, I mean, I think we see them the more. Was this a yeah. good use of the slanish guys? Thoughts? Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, they're pretty much like what I thought. You know, they're basically like hurling themselves because they like the pain so much because it's weird like oh my god Kane made this one comment like with this like he blew the arm off this woman who still started like laughing maniacally and coming at him he's like well okay some people do strange things in extremis <laughs> like that's pretty funny but well, as soon as they dropped down and he was like they're luridly clad or scantily clad I was like oh no oh no 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 yeah you found the god of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, friend. Good times are not going to be had. That's one of the funny things to me about Corn and Slanesh, too. It's, it has to be so frustrating when 
Joke's on you. They're into that. <laughs> Literally everything. They're into it. Doesn't like, matter. Like murder fucking? We, we discovered that. <laughs> yeah. We liked that before it was cool. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm going to carve you, like carve pieces off of you. <laughs> don't get me all hot and bothered right yeah, now. Don't threaten me with a good time. <laughs> Exactly. Like, <laughs> it has to be so frustrating. So, um, I mean, like, up until then, they die, and even then, they were like, I mean, pretty good. So, there's actually one uh, side quest early on in Diablo 4 where a demon lures away this guy, and when you find him, he's all chained up and it's been flayed. Yes, and he's talking about ecstasy. Yes. I was like, oh my he's god, like, we found. I just want more. I was like, we found Slanesh. <laughs> oh my god. Well, because she literally, the woman literally. Yeah. Yeah, and you're like, mm, I, I've, I've, woo, I've read enough Warhammer 40k to know where this is going. <laughs> I had the same thought because he's all chained up. And you're, like, oh yeah. I was like, he doesn't oh. have any skin. Is he still alive? Oh, he's still alive, and he's talking about ecstasy. This is not weird at all. Well, okay. So my first thought there is, I was like, damn, Blizz, you have to keep taking all the 40k stuff or all the Warhammer stuff. Um, you know, the best ideas pretty- are stolen. This is true. Um, I mean, again, you should have just kept Warhammer as a war, a Warcraft as a Warhammer game. Just saying, guys. Um, but the oh uh, damn, I never even uh, thought about it being a Warhammer fantasy game. Warcraft. It actually started out that way, no, and but it it didn't have to. But just the parallels, like, god damn it. Never thought Untri- about that. Fun trivia fact because is that it was supposed to be a Warhammer game. I think I can't remember because if they orcs actually had a formal... are, have a you know Cackney accent and wow. Oh, I feel like my yeah. mind was just blown. Of course, like the, in my defense, yeah. I have not played a single Warcraft game since Warcraft Three, so it's been a spell. That's fair, but yeah, that's your fun trivia fact. I can't remember if it was in partnership with Games Workshop or basically built the game and games workshop was like i don't think so and uh so they just jokes on you called, yeah i called it warcraft and then they came out with starcraft which is basically a 40k game mm. and i don't know how games workshop didn't slap them with some kind of lawsuit over that like no no no, no they're not tyranids they're zerg to be fair games workshop has only gotten their shit together in the last like i would say f- seven years Fair. When it comes to pretty much, I would say once Total Warhammer comes out, I think they finally were like, oh, when oh. when they decided to change the Eldar to the Eldari and the Imperial God to the Astra Militar, that is when they started getting their shit together with copyright. We and... can rant all of this. Yes. Exactly. And then for some reason, though, mild little rant here. For some reason, though, we look at all the Blizzard stuff and we're just like, oh, Blizzard <laughs> stealing from Games Workshop. So funny. But, and granted, this is not the best move ever, but that armoring of a Space Marine video is basically the teaser trailer for StarCraft II when that came out forever ago. With oh, the really? It's about damn time. Watch that armoring of, um, what's his name? Findlay, I can't think of his first name, but that armoring video. And then go and watch the armor of Space Marine. And then when that happened, everybody, myself included, was like, kind of come up with something original. Um... Oh, how the turns have tabled. <laughs> Anyways, yes, the Slanashi were a good. I do like I do like them as foils. Typically, we see that these are like your mic. Cut some out of their again. huh? Your mic cut out again. God damn it, you guys! I'm gonna end up having to buy a new mic. Guys, like um, I'm, I'm really, really sorry tonight. Like I don't know what's been going on. Like I know Jen's mic's been cutting in and out, and I don't know, but I don't think she has an echo. So. Hey, baby steps, you guys. Baby steps. Um, my husband's going to be thrilled when I tell him I need to buy a new mic. Uh, spoiler alert. It's for the good of the podcast. We got a thousand um, people subscribed to us on YouTube. We have to keep them. This is true. And your and shitty this... mic's not going to keep them. But you know what will keep them? These hats. I want everyone to know that when I told my daughter that we were so more and her mic cut out after she said oh for god's sake (laughs) anyways when i told my daughter that we were going to wear these she was mortified when we them she told me she was like do you want to lose your monetization so 
To which I said when I got that text, challenge accepted. Uh, toss a coin to your Aruba hat. And uh, as Jen replied to me, you can only YOLO once. It's true. And these hats scream, you only YOLO once. Um, the one thing I will say about the Slanashi is that with the Space Marines, they don't get to use some of their, like, their lower tier tricks, right? Like, again, like, Amber Fail, coming up, look all coquettish. Um, they don't get to use that so much Space Marines. Cause... Like, okay. So, like, when she showed it up... It must be fun for them, where they're like, this is easy. When she showed up, air quotes for podcast people, the first time, I was like, okay... I'm kind of pissed about that, that she was, like, undercover this whole time. Deus Essie Quinsoner. Yeah, and then it's not her. So, like, okay, I'm happy again. Yes. When she, when he's all of a sudden, like, this is not how this would work at all. I do, I like, I, I like to imagine for them, it's like, you know, like, when you tell jokes to kids or do magic tricks for little kids, and they're, like, all impressed because you could, in fact, you know, break your finger across, like, you know, the... With your thumb, uh, and they or, get all impressed. Pour the quarter behind somebody's ear. Exactly. I feel like that's this with the guard. The Slanish guys mm-hmm. are just like, ah, it's gonna be easy mode. Just, I don't know, wink at them and give them a kiss. Um, Speaking of that, good... God, what's behind my ear? Oh, look, it's an Aruban dollar. <laughs> <laughs> we were really kind of crazy about getting the coins. That was really fun, actually. Um, so here's what I have to say is that this book was. This book was so much fun, and I laughed so hard, and there was a like, good going on with the Slanesh guys and the corn guys and everything. It was a really good dynamic. And I feel like it's going to be, in so many ways, the opposite of our next book. <laughs> <laughs> I do not have the physical copy. I have a digital copy. Oh, well, I, I do have the physical left. copy. Ta-da. Pilgrims of Fire. By Justin D. Better. Did you just, did you, did we have to go that hard? Fire. Fire. Um, there's no alcohol involved tonight, y'all. No, uh, I'm just having my, you know, my makeshift Tana tea over here. But are you drinking it out of a bowl? You know, and I thought about that, so I just got a big clear mug instead. But no, I don't. If I had a clear bowl, you better believe I would have that. Because that'd be kind of fun. Everyone to know, I can't remember if I told the story on the last podcast. So when we first discovered these books, it would have been before my daughter was born because we were living in our old condo. I I go into the kitchen one day and my husband is holding a rice bowl, drinking water out of it. And of course, I'm like, what the hell are you doing? And he he was just like, well, the Caiaphas cane makes, they're always drinking water out of bowls. And it just sounded so refreshing. Was it? But he sat there for like all day drinking water out of a room. You know, honestly, when they said bowls, you know what I thought of was like the sake cups because yes. they look like yes. little bowls. Yes, exactly. That's kind of what I've always pictured are like the little the little sake cups. And like, that's a little bowl or maybe like the wider if you... tea cups that don't have mm-hmm. the... Yeah, they kind of look like a little bowl, yeah. I guess. You, um, well, you know, um, because in, in, in Japan, when they serve you green tea... They're kind of in those little bowls like that as well. Yes. To to pick up and sip. But um yeah, I did find it really funny though that Jurgen had a flask of tana tea on him at all times. Could you use some tea, Jürgen sir? <laughs> it was such a it was such a Jurgen thing to do. Uh, oh my god. You know, I would take Jurgen as an assistant, smell and all. Uh well, because it probably wouldn't smell to you. Because remember Amberly Bale's like, I've never said because that's how it manifests for Kane. Oh, I never noticed that she said that. So that's interesting. Yeah, it's that's part of the thing about him being a blunter is that that's how it manifests for. Because remember, he always talks about it, and people are always like, like where he talks about how people don't notice the smell, and he's mm. like, God, these people are being so polite. Um, <laughs> I've never, I honestly, I never noticed that, but that's interesting. So funny, and it's. I don't mean this as a knock to Justin Hill. I really like Justin Hill. Um, I mean, it is a knock to the sisters. We have not had a good track record of the sisters, and, which is no. sucks because the sisters are conceptually one of my favorite. I, I mean, you yeah. want to talk about girl talk about power, badass women right here, you know, 
We don't need to be seriously trans or have the power of God and power armor on their side. I mean, we don't have to be trans humans to take down space marines. No, and it makes them so much cooler because they don't feel they do feel fear. Unlike like it's not again, bravery is not fe- not feeling bravery is pushing through. Mm-hmm. And they do that. And so Mm. it's just been a little bit of a and of a course, little bit of a struggle and of course this one's about the order of our martyred lady <laughs> and it also I think I'm oh hey but she sure wants to stay alive the main character wants to stay alive so that's that's promising mm-hmm. I would yeah I would I would like that um, or at least because I feel like I've read so many good sisters characters but they always appear in other novels where they're not the lead character. Whenever they start dealing with the sisters, I'll... You know, I think just from reading the back of this book and seeing how the Repentia and all that stuff is not even mentioned, she's like, yet while others seek glory in their own martyrdom, Sister Heloise is determined to stay alive. Oh, wait. So that her death might serve a greater purpose when the God Emperor wills it. Well... No, I, that's fine. Because again, that's not, I'm searching for death. That's, look, yeah. I, if I have to go out in a hail of gunfire and some glorious battle, great. But I'm not going to just look for it at every, that is one of the things, again, I talk a lot about how wasteful the Imperium, some of the factions of the I feel as though there's really involved. It's like, I'll sacrifice myself for a meaningless thing. Seriously? They could have used it, you like 20 pages later. Mm-hmm. Uh, so anyways i have a lot of mixed feelings as you can see there's a lot of feels and emotions here about i'm very cautiously optimistic because justin hill has not stood me wrong thus far no i mean i have actually liked everything i've read of his yeah same same but uh the sisters okay but you know what we're gonna we're gonna, we're gonna go through it i'm just not expecting it funny as was and this was so it was a good vacation read let's put it that way i don't yes. think i wanted to read this. it was much better than the fabulous bill book this is true those were not good beach books <laughs> those were not a good beach books um yes so that's going to be our next book and i'm very excited for it in two weeks yeah i mean right? i've got to hope yeah. after reading the back of the book this is the first time i've actually sat down and read it because normally, Showing like off your physical copy. Well, you can show off your next one of Leviathan the next time, okay? Okay. <gasps> That's true. Yes, because Games Workshop or Black Library, whoever, your new system of how we pre-order books sucks. Look, I actually got a collector's edition and a physical copy of a book for the first time in like release for book releases. So you're gonna have. To, I, I'm I'm personally a fan. But yes, I do kind of agree with you that I'm like, you took one problem and you were like, what if we gave it a different? Yeah. Hmm. Pretty much. That's just right. Buy more servers. That's really all you guys have to do. Yes. And I'm just saying, um, as a product manager, I would love to help. But then again, they just got single sign on like two years ago. So I guess baby steps, right? I think about that sometimes, and I'm just like, oh, wow. I mean, they're pro- they haven't even fixed their search. Oh, my God. That would be, okay. That would be day one, think one. Okay? I am guessing that it's your e-commerce tool, search tag. Or maybe you just are using something like solar, plastic, plastic, tag search and making a- I'm just throwing this. What's really funny is that I'm not censoring her, guys. <laughs> her mic just totally cut out oh, the man. entire my speech. My mic must hate solar, too. I mentioned solar search, and it no. was like, oh, my God. But I, think, I think Games Workshop is somehow censoring you. Stop talking shit about our stuff. Your site sucks. It hurts my heart as a product manager. <laughs> Love you. Mean it. Kisses. Yeah. Want to leave us out, Carrie? <laughs> I sure will. I'm going to laugh if I find out when I like start editing this that, oh, yeah, my mic went out all the time, too, because then I might just like flip a few things in the corners. Yes, like I. Yeah. 
I handle things professionally, you guys. All right. So you've listened to the Warhammer 40K book club regarding the Trader's Hand by Sandy Mitchell. It's in here. It's in here somewhere. Be sure to join us next time for Pilgrims of Fire. Fire. Like, like I think it was like, this book is on fire. Fire. By Justin D. Hill. We are an unofficial book club and not affiliated with the Black Library or any of its affiliates. You can find both the vidcast and podcast on our website, wh40kbookclub.com. If you like this episode, please like, subscribe, give a review, and all those good things to the vidcast on YouTube or the podcast anywhere you get podcasts. Our site also has articles about adventures and reading other Warhammer 40k books and short stories outside of the book club books. So please stay a while and read from a crack. I'm not really Alfarious because I don't know if Al Alfarious would look in this fabulous hat. I don't know. I feel like it would be the type of thing that if they wanted to blend in... <laughs> yeah. You know what? You wear this in Aruba, you totally blend in. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like every time I put this hat on, I gain 20 years. <laughs> I feel like I am now a boomer named Charlene and I work. I need like a convertible too now. <laughs> I just feel like I need to start talking in a really great Southern accent. I'm from Alabama in this fifth cruise down to Aruba. The husband and I just come down here every year. And we know all the bars. You know, you don't have to exactly be Cheryl from the South. Cause you but could... I want to be, I want to be Cheryl from the South. Because you could also be from New Jersey. There was a lot of them there. That's true. You know, and they did look pretty fabulous in their hats. Or I could be Karen and I could be from Minnesota with my daughter, Marcy. And we came down here for the first time and the sun is very dangerous to us, don't you know? <laughs> Have you seen how pale I am? That's not even a joke. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, I kind of do look like I'm from Minnesota. <laughs> But I just love the beach. In do we have beaches back home, don't you know? We go to the beach all the time. I mean, this is kind of as good as what we got, like, off the boardwalk, you know? But not entirely. I mean, the water is clearer. I'll give it that. Well, I'll tell you this for nothing. None of these people in Aruba could play hockey. Mm. <laughs> I bet none of them have even seen an ice skate. I don't know. I bet they'd be good bobsledders. Haven't you seen Cool Runnings? <laughs> No, we don't watch anything that's above a G-rated movie in our house. Some of you big city women like to do that, but not us, no. Is that not G-rated? I think it's PG. Oh. Huh. Learn something new every day. All right, We're so not that racy. I don't let my Marcy watch anything that's above G-rated. <laughs> Mike now crackling. Anyways, good night. We've got into New Jersey. We've got into the Alabama. And her mic just died again. We gotta go. Good night, everybody. <laughs>